So in this video, we're talking about how the acquisition of empire slowly transforms not only the physical city of Rome, but Roman society and culture as well. We've already talked about some of the effects of Rome's initial expansion in Italy on the Roman economy and society. As Rome's power in the Mediterranean grows, these effects are magnified. The most dramatic effects involve the economic factors. Roman and Italian business and industry is at the forefront of the Roman presence in Sicily, Spain, Gaul, North Africa, and especially in the East. As rapidly swelling numbers of Romans and Italians seek a stake in the rich resources these lands offer in minerals like silver, gold, tin, and copper, as well as abundant natural resources such as grain, timber, pelts, salt, wine, and oils, as well as luxury goods such as marble, jewelry, and fine textiles. These lands also offer lucrative markets for expanding Roman goods. As the Roman Italian presence widens and deepens in the exotic and wealthy lands of the East, investment by the wealthy in overseas ventures starts to unbind the flow of Roman capital from the physical city of Rome. Meanwhile, increasing numbers of young men seek their fortune away from Rome in the Hellenistic East, leaving Rome with fewer young men of property in Rome itself directly involved in politics or available for military service, while at the same time there is an influx of middle class, artisans and skilled laborers and poor flowing into Rome as the center of a great and growing empire. Roman industry and agriculture and the easy availability of foreign slaves in large numbers resulting from Rome's constant wars, many of them literate, trained, and skilled from the sophisticated lands of the East, dramatically solidified the dependence of the larger Roman economy on both an underclass of slaves for factory work, estate farming, mining, and household labor, and a further underclass of ex-slaves. Liberti, or freedmen and freedwomen, who oversaw the slaves or performed skilled labor in both business and the home. The availability of foreign prisoners of war from exotic barbarian lands of inland Europe and Spain, North Africa, and other lands also opened up new opportunities for public entertainment in the form of gladiatorial shows. As we've seen, public games in Rome were religious events designed to please the gods. From the beginning of Rome's story, the public games were also an effective way of reinforcing Rome's collective identity and sense of community by creating a space where all Romans of every clan and class, rich and poor alike, gathered together to see each other. All of them Romans engaged together in a distinctly Roman act. With Rome's social makeup shifting dramatically and with the population swelling rapidly year by year, these events in which all Romans gathered to cheer on rival chariot teams or root for one gladiator or the other became vitally important to Rome's cultural identity. This was especially true during the Principate, where public games were the primary venue in which the people of Rome interacted with the princeps. And as the great cities of the Roman Empire came to more and more closely resemble Rome itself in culture, social structure, and architecture, amphitheaters arose in which provincials interacted with each other and with their governors in the same manner as at Rome. It's important to note that while the gladiators were often technically slaves and some were freedmen or citizens fallen on hard times, most gladiatorial shows were just that, shows, and though they were expected to fight hard, they were treated more as performers than as abused laborers. Some gained fame and financial security, others did not. The main point here is that the Roman non-citizen underclass was not all of one piece. It was massive and diverse, and the conditions of Roman slaves and liberty depended on the kind of work they did, where they were doing it, and the family with which they were associated. Many slaves had a harsh life, especially in the mines. Many were better treated, especially in wealthier homes and those doing work that was more clerical than menial. And many were freed after an extended period of service, because amongst Romans, slavery was customarily understood as a temporary service ending in manumission, release from the hand, or manus, 
of ownership. After manumission, the ex-slaves would continue to be associated with the family that they had been working for, and an ex-slave would take a new Roman name that made him a part of that clan. The dramatic increase in wealth brought about by empire spawned a myriad of new public works, paved highways and aqueducts in Italy and eventually in the provinces as well, plus a major building boom in Rome, including many new temples and grander houses for the upper class. Some of this building boom filtered down into the lower classes and resulted in new homes and apartment buildings in the Roman city center as well. In agriculture, conquered lands were redistributed to the poor but also amassed in large estates, producing lucrative crops for export out of Italy and increasing the demand for slaves. As Rome bristled with new wealth, new buildings, and new people, the need to be seen as a world capital on par with Athens or Alexandria and the embarrassment of not measuring up culturally with their own conquered subjects in southern Italy, North Africa, and the East led to an appropriation and Romanization of Greek art forms, especially in architecture, visual arts like sculpture and painting, literature, and theater, as well as education. The aristocracy of Rome developed a liking for Greek things as a sign of status and sophistication, not to replace Roman culture, but to augment it. An emphasis in Greek-style education developed amongst those who could afford it, so the children of the upper classes were raised being tutored in the verses of Homer and the works of Aristotle. And being able to speak Greek as well as Latin, and the ability to quote from Homer, which was how the Greek language was taught in both the East and in Rome, became, from this point onward, the mark of an educated person. One of Augustus's favorite expressions was, a radish may know no Greek, but I do, which is to say, as an educated man, I can tell what's going on here. This appropriation of Greek forms and tools tended to involve taking Greek concepts and making them Roman. For example, the arch is a mundane element of Greek architecture, but the triumphal arch is not only a Greek arch reshaped to be distinctly Roman in appearance, but has a solely Roman meaning in relation to the triumph of victorious Roman general. Greek-style columns and methods of construction were given a Roman feel and meaning in the Forum and elsewhere. Larger buildings than either Romans or Greeks had been able to make before were made possible by the Roman development of molded concrete. Private homes began to show Greek-inspired elements like pools and colonnaded walkways and marble sculptures in place of older Roman forms like bronze and terracotta. The cultivation of Greek forms of expression included history, rhetoric, philosophy, tragedy, comedy, poetry, and prose literature. These adaptations were repurposed in support of the Roman identity. And even though the Roman elite now spoke Greek, crucially, they wrote in Latin and for a Roman audience. The main goal of all this appropriation being to improve and elevate and expand the Roman culture. So the most prominent example of this is Virgil's Aeneid, which takes the Greek form of epic poetry employed by Homer to tell a tale in Latin about the founding of Rome and the creation of Roman traditions and values. But the practice goes back much further. Plautus, writing 200 years before Virgil in the 3rd century BCE, used the Greek form of theatrical comedy to write Latin comedic plays around Latin themes. For example, one of these, the Menaikmi, follows the Greek form of a farcical comedy about mistaken identity involving twins, but the stock characters are Latin types and the themes of the farce involve loyalty and other elements of Roman virtue. To a certain extent, even conservatives like Cato the Elder understood the value of Hellenization. Ironically, the Greeks themselves were not greatly admired. It was obvious to the Romans that the greatest accomplishments of the Greeks were all in the past, and the present-day Greeks they had absorbed or conquered were diminished versions of a once great people. But they saw nothing wrong with merging those past accomplishments and capabilities into Roman culture, creating a better Roman identity with all its traditions and meanings intact, but with new strength derived from these augmented abilities. 
The accumulation of Roman conquered land in Italy catalyzes a growing crisis in the swelling estates of the rich and the diminishing numbers of ordinary landholding Roman citizens, meaning fewer men available for military service just when Rome's proliferating wars create an acute and urgent need for citizen soldiers. This crisis comes to a head at the end of the second century with the Gracchus brothers, as we'll see next week. The legion itself, with years of service before discharge now and based in camps far from home, is developing a separate identity from Rome, and that dissonance will also soon develop into crisis. As Roman dominion swells, there is a greater need for leadership with imperium to govern the provinces as we've seen and also to lead Rome's many armies. This led to the routine use of proconsuls and propraetors, starting with the Second Punic War, and from there this becomes a permanent fixture of the Roman Empire. This involved extending or proroguing the imperium of a consul or a praetor beyond his year in office. The proliferation of pro-magistracies not only supplied governors for Rome's growing number of provinces, but provided commanders for Roman legions spread across the Mediterranean world. A crucial benefit of this practice was also that, with Rome swelling in population and the need to administer the city becoming more and more complicated, it was becoming a liability for both consuls to be away from Rome for much of the year, leaving the praetors and the senate holding the bag especially given the risk of one or both consuls dying in battle and not returning. From the year 200 BCE onward, at least one of the consuls was usually in Rome, administering the city, convening the Senate and Assembly, and, critically, holding elections for the following year's consuls and praetors. Even in years like 146, where Rome was waging multiple wars at different ends of the Mediterranean, one of the consuls was there in Rome to hold elections and provide a focus for the Roman sense of their institutions in operation. An interesting side effect of this shift is that after 200, the Romans stopped the routine use of the dictatorship. The chief uses of the dictatorship of the previous century, holding elections and command of armies in great wars, were now being performed by consuls and proconsuls, a sign that Rome after Zama was truly a different city from the one that had thrown out its kings 300 years before. All this change and tension within Rome brings about the ultimate crisis of the Roman Republic, as we'll start to see next week. For now, that's that.